Welcome to Built Through Time. Today, we're embarking on a, a really fascinating journey, tracing the incredible evolution of computers. We're going from these you know, colossal machines that filled entire rooms. Yeah, absolutely enormous things. Right down to the tiny, powerful chips that literally run our modern world. Our mission here is to pull out the most important insights, the really surprising facts from this history, giving you a kind of shortcut to being well-informed. It's a great story. And it's not just about engineering marvels, though there are plenty of those. It's also about human ingenuity, persistence, and, well, even some pretty dramatic rivalries that really push things forward. What's uh, particularly interesting to me is how fast the actual definition of computer changed and how much of that change was driven by, you know, urgent needs, especially wartime needs. Right. Necessity driving invention. Exactly. It was like the accelerator pedal for computing. Okay, let's unpack that a bit. Before any of the electronic wonders we're now familiar with, the word computers, well, it meant people. That's right, actual human beings. Can you imagine sitting all day, just adding and subtracting numbers, filling out tables for what, artillery shells? Taxes. All sorts of things. It yeah. was incredibly laborious, painstaking work and prone to errors, of course. And this whole process, this human bottleneck, it created a huge demand for automation, which is where someone like Charles Babbage steps in back in the early 19th century. He dreamed up these incredible mechanical devices. His uh, difference engine was designed specifically to compute tables of numbers automatically. So repeated addition, right. A mechanical way to avoid human error. Precisely. Yeah. But here's where it gets really interesting, I think. Babbage then imagined an even grander idea, the analytical engine. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't just a calculator. This was, conceptually at least, the ancestor of modern computers. It had what he called a mill. Which is basically our CPU, the processor. Exactly. And a store. The memory. Right. And data. Entered using punched cards, just like those jacquard looms used for weaving patterns. It's really quite brilliant. But it raises a key question. If this analytical engine was so revolutionary, why wasn't it built in his lifetime? Yeah. What happened? Well, the simple answer is the technology of the 19th century just couldn't keep up. The manufacturing wasn't precise enough for his incredibly complex designs. Think about it. It wasn't until 1991, like over a century later, that a functioning difference engine was finally built to his plans. Wow. And it weighed five tons. It had 8,000 moving parts. It gives you a sense of the sheer scale of his vision versus what was possible then. And of course, you can't talk about Babbage without mentioning Ada Lovelace. Lord Byron's daughter. Absolutely not. She was far more than just, you know, his publicist or promoter. She's often called the world's first computer programmer, isn't she? That's the common understanding, yes. She wrote what amounts to an algorithm, a step-by-step -step description for how the analytical engine could compute Bernoulli numbers. But even more than that, she saw the potential. She <laughs> predicted these machines might one day compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music. That's incredible. Thinking beyond just calculation to actual creation back then. It really is. She grasped that these machines could manipulate symbols, not just numbers. A foundational idea for, well, everything that came later, including AI. Her work was kind of overlooked for a long time, though, wasn't it? Tragically, yes, for decades. It's a pattern we unfortunately see again later in computing history. Groundbreaking ideas sometimes take a while to be recognized. So we move from gears and scheme to electricity. A huge leap. The first electronic digital computer arrived in 1937, built by Dr. John Atanasoff and Clifford Berry, the atanasoff Berry computer, or ABC. Right, the ABC. And what's fascinating here is how it pioneered some really crucial elements we still use today. Things like binary arithmetic using zeros and ones. The fundamental language of computers. Exactly. And electronic switching elements. Plus, it separated memory and the computing functions. Pretty advanced stuff at the time. But it wasn't quite like our computers today. No, not really. It was designed for a very specific purpose-solving systems of linear equations. Right. It wasn't programmable in the general sense, or what we call Turing complete. Still, quite a machine. Over 300 vacuum tubes weighed about 700 pounds. Then World War II really pushed things forward dramatically. Oh, massively. The urgency was incredible. In 1943, there was Colossus, right? built by the British military to break codes. Very secretive stuff. Very hush-hush, yes. <laughs> and vital for the war effort. And then, in 1946, the electronic numerical integrator and computer ENIS was completed. Ah, ENIS. The first general-purpose digital computer. And it was a beast. I read it weighed 30 tons. 30 tons, yes. Yeah. And had something like 18,000 vacuum tubes. Good grief. 
They said when they turned it on, lights dimmed in parts of Philadelphia. That's the story. The power draw was immense. Imagine plugging that in today. It was primarily designed to calculate artillery firing tables for the U.S. Army. A critical task. But its first actual program was something else. Yeah, its first real computation was a study on the feasibility of the hydrogen bomb. So high stakes from the very beginning. And a speed. It could do about 5,000 additions per second. Which sounds slow now, but it was 1,000 times faster than the electromechanical machines before it. A huge leap. But here's something I find amazing, and it often gets missed. Machley and Eckert designed ENA, the hardware, but the actual programming, setting it up to run those calculations, that was done by a team of six women. That's absolutely right. Kathleen Antonelli, Sean Bartik, Betty Holberton, Marlon Meltzer, Francis Spence, and Ruth Teitelbaum. And it wasn't like coding today. They were given blueprints, schematics. Right. They had to figure out the algorithms themselves and then physically program the machine by adjusting thousands of switches and plugging in cables. Imagine debugging that, literally tracing wires and checking connections. Their work was fundamental. They were essentially inventing the practice of software development on the fly. John Bartik later said that really knowing the hardware inside and out helped them find problems right down to identifying a single faulty vacuum tube among thousands. That's incredible skill. It required massive innovation, problem solving. Yeah. They basically created the field of computer programming. Yet for decades, they were largely unrecognized, called operators or worse. Familiar story, unfortunately. And I heard there was some drama about the patent, too, about who really invented the first electronic computer. Oh, yes. Quite a significant legal battle. EDNA was initially patented and widely considered the first. But a 1973 U.S. court ruling actually invalidated that ENA patent. Really? On what grounds? The court found that the ENA inventors had derived key concepts from John Atanasoff and his earlier ABC machine. So that ruling gave legal recognition to Atanasoff as the inventor of the first electronic digital computer. And importantly, it put the fundamental concepts into the public domain. So no one company could own the basic idea of an electronic computer. That's huge. It really was. It shaped the entire future development of the industry. OK, so we've got these giant, power-hungry machines full of vacuum tubes. What comes next? The next truly revolutionary leap, 1947. Bell Labs, the invention of the transistor. By Shockley, Bardeen, and Breton? That's them. And this was a complete game changer, a seminal shift, really. Transistors were tiny compared to vacuum tubes. They were cheaper to make. They used way less power, and they didn't generate nearly as much heat. So they tackled all the big problems of those first-generation machines. Size, cost, heat, reliability. Exactly. Suddenly, computers could be smaller, more reliable, and, well, more practical. And what did that mean for, you know, actual computers people could buy? It paved the way for the first commercial computers. Yeah. The Universal Automatic Computer Univac 1 came out in 1951, famous for predicting the 52 presidential election results. God. IBM also jumped in with its 650 and 700 series machines. This was the beginning of computers moving out of just military and university labs and into the business world. So computers start becoming actual tools for companies. Right. And connecting this to the bigger picture, this era saw an explosion in software development, too. With more reliable hardware available, people developed over 100 different programming languages. Computers got memory, operating systems, ways to store data like tape and disks, printers for output. It started becoming much more versatile. Exactly. Moving beyond just being giant calculators to becoming general purpose information processing machines. Okay, transistors were great. A huge step. But connecting lots of them individually was still complex. Very complex. Wiring them all together was a major challenge as circuits got more sophisticated. Which brings us to the third generation, the integrated circuit, the chip. Precisely. In 1958, Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments created the first one. It was kind of a hybrid design, still needed tiny gold wires to connect the components. But then, just a year later... Just a year later, 1959, Robert Noyce, who later co-founded Intel independently, invented a much more practical version the monolithic integrated circuit. His design put all the components onto a single piece of silicon and connected them with printed aluminum lines on the chip itself. Ah, so that made mass production much easier. Dramatically easier. And, and cheaper and more reliable. This was the key to scaling up complexity. And get this, NASA played a really critical role here, didn't they? Oh, absolutely crucial. Between about 1961 and 1965, NASA was the single biggest buyer of integrated circuits. Why was that? The space race especially the Apollo program. 
They desperately needed electronics that were small, lightweight, used little power, and were incredibly reliable for the moon missions. Even though they were expensive back then. Yeah. Even though they were very expensive initially. NASA's demand basically kick-started the industry and proved the technology worked under extreme conditions. Space exploration really accelerated microchip development. So this leads to a really important question. How did these integrated circuits get us to the computers we use every day? Well, the biggest milestone, arguably, was the Intel 4004, introduced in 1971. It's the first microprocessor. The world's first commercially available microprocessor, yeah. It squeezed an entire central processing unit, the brain of the computer, onto a single chip. That just sounds revolutionary. A whole CPU on one tiny piece of silicon. It fundamentally changed everything. And the 4004 paved the way for others, like the Intel 8080. Exactly. The 8080 was hugely influential. It powered many of the very first personal computers. And its successor, the 8086, well, that established the by 86 architecture. Which is still the basis for most PCs and laptops today. That's incredible longevity. It really is. That basic design, that instruction set from the late 70s, still underpins so much of modern computing. So what does this all mean for us? The microprocessor didn't just help, it really ignited the personal computer revolution. Right. Suddenly computers weren't just for massive organizations. Exactly. We saw MS-DOS pop up in 1980. Then IBM introduced its personal computer, the IBM PC, in 1981. That was huge. And Apple came along with the Macintosh in 84. With its graphical interface, icons, the mouse. Huh. making computers much more user-friendly. And then Windows really took over in the 90s, bringing that graphical approach to the IBM-compatible world. There was a massive shift. Computing power started moving on to desktops, into homes and small businesses. And it wasn't just about work. I remember reading that in 1984, Adidas put a microchip in a shoe, the Micropacer. Uh-huh, yes, the Micropacer. It tracked your distance, pace, calories burned. That's kind of amazing, from calculating bomb trajectories to tracking your morning run, all on a tiny chip. It really shows how quickly this technology started permeating every aspect of life. It was becoming ubiquitous. Which brings us to today. Microchips, often smaller than your fingernail, contain billions of transistors now. Billions. It's staggering. And they are the unseen brains inside. Well, almost everything. Smartphones, cars, medical equipment, critical infrastructure, even your coffee maker probably has one. And their presence is completely pervasive, yeah. utterly foundational to modern life. And if you connect that to the bigger picture globally, the microchip industry is now one of the most critical sectors in the world. Mm -hmm. You could argue it's second only to maybe agriculture and its fundamental importance to how our civilization functions. That important. Absolutely. The ability to design and manufacture advanced chips. Mm. It's a huge symbol of technological power, economic strength. It's central to trade disputes, geopolitics, national security. It's become a real strategic battle round, so it really makes you wonder, what's next? We hear about things like quantum computing. Mm -hmm. The potential there is immense, though still early days for practical application. And these exascale supercomputers, like Frontier, performing over an exaflop. That's a billion billion calculations per second. It's almost impossible to grasp that kind of speed. When you think back to those human computers slowly adding numbers or even Babbage's gears, it's just an incredible journey. It truly is. A testament to that relentless cycle of ingenuity and necessity pushing the boundaries decade after decade. From those room-sized mechanical dreams to microscopic chips that now power our entire world, the evolution of the computer is just an amazing story of relentless innovation. Mm -hmm. We've gone from people doing the calculating to machines that compute at speeds we could barely have conceived of just a few generations ago, transforming absolutely every part of our lives. And this whole journey, it raises a really interesting question for you to think about. As this computing power keeps accelerating, seemingly exponentially, what new problems, what new challenges or opportunities are we going to discover that only these incredibly sophisticated machines will be able to help us solve? What comes after the exaflop? Thank you for listening to Built Through Time. We hope this look back has given you a fresh perspective on the hidden giants and the tiny, tiny wonders that really built our digital age.